Today, everyone's focus is on the stock market, it's on oil, but meanwhile, real estate is really an important issue that is getting overlooked. You came here for the truth, so let me unveil that for you. Today, we are going to look specifically at real estate, and I wanna focus on what's happening in Canada because this is an extreme example. At this time, right now, 2020, the only thing left in Canada is real estate. There is nothing else. Oil is worthless. And if you look at some of the futures and so on, it's actually in the negative. It's truly historic. When you see what's happening with the economy, it's going down. The demand is going down. Stores are going to be shut down. Retailers, which occupy such a large percentage of the public, their jobs, they are all going down. Who knows what will come through on the other side? It's going to look very different in a few months time. And as we move through even further, there will be definite changes. So we need to look at what's happening in this particular industry from all angles. Most importantly, we need to talk about debt. Once safer than gold, Canadian real estate braces for reckoning. I believe that what we are seeing in Canada should be a warning to all of those around the world. There is no more extreme place than in Canada, specifically Vancouver and Toronto. When you look at these two cities, people should be very worried. I'm going to give you the details on that. I'm not just going to say it. It's not my opinion. I will show you the facts. Canadian housing once seemed so infallible that the head of the world's biggest asset manager in 2015 described Vancouver's condos as a better store of wealth than gold. I'm sure he's kicking himself right now though. Job losses and uncertainty are roiling property markets from the UK to Australia to Hong Kong. Canada's situation is more precarious than most. As its oil sector shriveled in recent years, now it's totally destroyed, Canada's economy became ever more driven by real estate, an industry now in a state of paralysis. Nearly one in three workers has applied for income support. One in three workers. Okay, remember that. What's more, its households are among the world's most indebted, poorly placed to weather the storm. So we've got massive debt on top of this, and I'm talking about all levels of debt. You could break that down to credit card debt. We got student in debt of course we're looking at what's happening with HELOCs home equity line of credit you can see mortgages are really the biggest though you can see all of the different types they each have their own interest rate associated with it but the biggest one by far is mortgages now of course you stretch that out over a long period of time and they call this manageable and whenever you say the word manageable you need to put a set of quotes around it because it's not actually real they're being silly. This is very, very key to understand when you look at what's going on in real estate all around the world. Everything is going to be okay if it all stays the same. But occasionally you have an event like we're dealing with today that disrupts all of it. When you've got the job losses and you've got companies shutting down left, right and center, what do you think is going to happen to this debt? People are not going to be able to pay it back. They're going to have to do their bankruptcies on the personal side, on the business side as well. This needs to be understood by the masses no matter where you live. If you're in Norway, if you're in Australia, if you're in the United States, please listen to this information. This chart here compares the G7. Canadian households spend the highest proportion of income to service debt among the G7 nations. Take a look when you see this chart comparing all of these nations, which in general, everybody's in debt. But when you compare an individual's income to their debt, it looks really, really scary. And there are many different ways to look at this type of information, but Canada seems Seems to be around let's say 12% or so. That's much higher than the United States which probably looks like around 8% or so and we can go down the list. Essentially just wanted to give you a comparison of the different nations but when you really look in closer you can't do this on a country level. It's just too broad. If I compare Vancouver and Toronto even to for example Montreal or some of the other cities 
cities around much smaller cities, you're going to get a different picture. But where's the population? This is where it's at. We have to look at the most populous cities in order to give a general view when we're having a discussion. That's why I tend to use Vancouver and Toronto. The country may not have much of a choice but to prop up housing. I want to stop there and just acknowledge the fact that interest rates right now are at the historic lows. What else can you possibly do to make this go even higher? You're bringing these rates down to levels they should have never been at in the first place and we deal with the consequences. And the solution to that is more of the same? Ridiculous. Real estate has become Canada's largest sector. I need to make that clear right here in the Bloomberg article. They tell you that I've said that many times before. I've been laughed at. I've been yelled at. I've been called stupid. I'm showing you right here. I quote it. Let's move on. Including residential construction, it accounted for 15% of economic output last year. Energy accounted for 9%. So that gives you an idea of the magnitude here. 15% of the economic output is just building things. There's so much unnecessary building. If you just see it, it's ridiculous. There are cranes everywhere. Rents are ridiculous, but they still build and build and build. And the bigger the bubble gets, the worse the pop is going to be. If it collapses, there's not much that can pick up the slack, certainly not oil, nor the seemingly unflappable consumer. Canadians have been on a two decade spending spree since a downward shift in mortgage rates began in the 90s. Toronto and Vancouver, the two biggest housing markets, haven't had a major correction during that time. Housing turned into a wealth conjuring machine as values spiraled higher, homeowners felt richer, they spent more, borrowed more, and sent prices even higher. So we had 2008, where you looked around the world, and there was somewhat of a dip down for some places, and now we had seen that going higher. If you look at the prices for Toronto and Vancouver, it's basically just a slight dip downward, almost just a slowdown, if you want to look at it like that, and they have continued to rocket to new highs. There has has been some turmoil from 2017, specifically April 2017, up into, let's say, 2018, 2019. But in general, those markets have moved up along with debt. It is all because of what has happened with debt. The central bank has been doing this because they know it's 15% of economic output. If real estate starts to slow down, the entire country goes into recession. There's nothing else to pull it up. That virtuous circle just pop. The city of Vancouver fears it's heading for insolvency after it surveyed residents and found that 45% of households say they can't pay their full mortgage next month and a quarter expect to pay less than half of the property tax bills this year. The city itself is doing the survey. That, that, this is what it's telling you. The survey is being done. They're asking people. We know that's just a small subset of the entire population, but it's still important to look at. People can't pay their bills. I've shown you statistics before anywhere between $200 and $400 of an unexpected expense, and that will crush people. That's how you know you've got a real real issue. This is particularly evident in Canada today. But look around, whether you're in New York City, maybe some of the major cities in California, Miami, London, and Sydney, and everywhere. Look around. It's the same exact thing. People push themselves to the absolute edge. Everything is totally fine. The bull market can go on for 11 years, and then one day, poof, it's all down the drain. And people don't realize it. No, 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 no. Can happen, can happen, can happen, and then suddenly it happens. And then I want to finish with this. Today, Canadian households owe $1.76 for every dollar in disposable income. In Vancouver, that spikes to more than $2.30, a ratio that puts the so-called supercar capital of North America on par with Iceland before the global financial crisis. You have to understand how extreme this is. What Canadian households owe for every dollar in disposable income, this is a completely unsustainable path. These numbers are outdated too. I'm sure it got worse because every time I see these, they get higher and higher on average. Vancouver, 2.32. Toronto, 2.08. 
eight. Even the other cities like Calgary and Montreal are also very, very high. And what's their solution? To bring interest rates lower. Right now, we're looking at an interest rate of 0.25%. The central bank started to do QE. They're buying provincial bonds. They're buying corporate bonds. They're buying anything and everything. And why? Because they realize how dangerous this is. I've warned about this so many times before, and now finally we are seeing the effects of the debt problem that people have got themselves into. You need an economic detox periodically. It's so important, and yet they don't let it happen. A crisis can be a time in which we can reassess the situation, where we can find fair value. They never let it get the fair value, but things can come back down to earth. Many real estate markets around, let's say, 2010 or so were destroyed when you look at the prices that they were at in maybe 2006 into 2007. But the affordability increased. That means people who were diligently saving, suddenly they had some money, they could put it into a home. Maybe they can go and put it into an investment and fix up a home and split it between two people and figure out a way to put that money to work. It's usually those who extend themselves too far who are in the most trouble. But you only realize that when the bubble bursts. That's all for this video. If you found it informative, please give me that thumbs up button. When you do, you're supporting me. Thank you very much. If you want to check me out on Instagram, on Twitter, new content on there every single day at the Money GPS. Selling online today is so important. It's so key. But where do you learn it from? There's a whole bunch of nonsense online. You can tell when people don't actually sell and yet they're trying to make a quick buck. Well, you know what? I realized what was going on. I wanted my subscribers to know about this because they were asking for solutions. I created a free e-course. It's available to you at the amazongps.com. In my books, I talk about real estate and how important it is. I talk about it on one level as an asset class. I also talk about the warnings of how the higher the prices go, the more indebted the individual is, the bigger the crisis will be. If you want to check these out, flip through, through them, you can do so at the link in the description. If you want the audiobook instead, moneygps.com. Wait a second, don't go anywhere. Have you seen this video? Really, really good stuff in here. Definitely check it out. Click on it. I'll see you there.